As you heard, I'm Howard W. Buffett. Uh, and just so there's no confusion, later this morning you'll hear from Howard G. Buffett, uh, who is my father. Uh, and I'd just like to point out uh, to never underestimate the importance of a single letter uh, when it comes to somebody's name. Um, I uh, am a trustee of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, and I can't tell you how proud we are to be co-sponsoring today's event uh, with SARE and with USDA. Uh, it was about a year ago, uh, almost to this week, uh, that uh, Rob Myers and I had our first call. And uh, Daniel, I think you were on the phone, and a couple other folks from our team. And I was uh, driving out in western uh, Nebraska near Ogallala. And by the end of the call, I literally pulled the car over. I don't know if I told you I was doing this. Because uh, Rob's vision was uh, just so energizing that I literally I didn't want to get in a car accident as I was talking with my hands and uh, getting excited about what we thought this could turn into um, and how important we thought it would be to bring everybody into the same room like we're doing here over the next few days. Uh, so with that, I want to especially thank Rob and all the work uh, that he has done over the past year. I think it's been unending work. Uh, but also the planning committee, uh, who had almost uh, weekly and, and monthly phone calls, uh, also for almost a year, uh, and the teams at SARE, SWCS, uh, our foundation, uh, as well as some of the volunteers and the folks here at the hotel have really brought this together. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank everybody who has come uh, to attend today. Um, it's not necessarily easy to trek out to Omaha, and as you uh, heard Jim reference, uh, the weather posed a few challenges. Um, and taking a few days out of your work week uh, and trekking here, um, uh, it, it takes a lot. And it shows that you care uh, or that you want to learn more and you have interest. Um, and for me, it's special because Omaha is my home. Uh, and one of the few things I said to Rob when we were having these conversations was that I really wanted to have the meeting here in Omaha. Uh, and I'm really glad everyone was able to make it out. Uh, the, the conference today and tomorrow uh, and in the past few days uh, is important to me for a few reasons. First, I've spent the last two years uh, working alongside my father uh, at uh, our family foundation, and spending that time with him really reminded me of one of the most important principles that he taught me when I was growing up, and that is of stewardship. Whether it has to do with the charitable dollars that we manage, uh, our uh, research farms we operate in Illinois or Arizona, or the family farms that we have, including the one just north here of Omaha, uh, I have learned from him uh, that few things matter more uh, than that of stewardship. And, uh, and I know that uh, far uh, a few <laughs> better stewards uh, than that of my father, and I know it's a quality uh, that so many of us in here share, uh, that we all think of ourselves as stewards in one way or another, whether it's of the land or whether it's of uh, public dollars or natural resources. Now, over the past few years, I've also learned that the task of being a good steward uh, applies more broadly to life as well. And uh, some of you in here might have heard us talk about uh, what we call our 40 chances. Uh, it's the book that Jim uh, referenced a few minutes ago. And it's a very simple idea, uh, but it can have profound meaning depending on whether uh, or not you uh, think about it in the context of your own day-to-day -day life. Uh, the idea is that once someone finishes school uh, and they get some training and they maybe start their first job and they, they decide what career path they want to go down, they'll have about 40 good years during their career to do the best job that they can. They're going to have about 40 years to accomplish their goals. And that's the idea behind 40 chances. Each year is a chance to do the best that you possibly can. For those of us who farm, it means that from uh, the time we take over our farm, uh, whether it's a farm that we bought or we inherited or it's been in the family, uh, to the time that we pass it on to the next generation, we also have about 40 seasons or 40 crops to do the exact same thing, to grow the best crop that we can possibly grow and to be the best stewards of the land that we can be. In the context of preserving our land and natural resources, it's easy to understand how important these limited number of chances really are because we have so few. This concept, as I mentioned, is the basis for my father's book. It's titled 40 Chances. Uh, there's a copy of it in your conference bag. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, and in it, we talk about how our foundation has given itself uh, a self-imposed 40-year deadline before we go out of business. And we talk more about it in the book, but I'll just explain that part of why we do that is to constantly remind us that we have to remain focused on our goals, and we have to always ask ourselves if we are doing the best that we can possibly do, because we have so limited time in order to accomplish those goals. We also discuss a lot in the book about the relationship between soil health and long-term food security, both in the context of global hunger and our global food systems. Now, one of the primary focuses of today's conference is the adoption of cover crops. You'll hear the term uh, thrown out uh, of achieving 20 million acres grown by the year 2020, which is both an ambitious but realistic goal. It's a goal that's a critical thing in the fight against soil erosion and environmental degradation. But we also don't want to lose sight of the big picture. 
Reaching our cover crop goal is one of the first steps in designing production systems that are both uh, symbiotic and ecologically sustainable in the context of the growing food demands that our uh, world is facing. My father often talks about agriculture needing a brown revolution, a soil-based revolution, one that builds farming systems that increase yield while addressing soil health and water quality and with a reduced environmental footprint. We believe in this strongly. Through our work at the foundation and for a number of years now, we've been running an advocacy and awareness campaign called Harvesting the Potential, as you see as part of the conference title. And we're doing this to draw attention to the importance of conservation agriculture. Through this campaign, we've seen a growing interest in cover crops, uh, as well as soil health more broadly in the agricultural community, which is promising. Harvesting the Potential has focused on a variety of important elements. We talk about the importance of adopting no-till, or if need be, strip-till practices. We talk a lot about resource management, whether it's nutrient management, residue management, or water management. And we work on educating producers about the various cropping systems uh, that are most appropriate for their farms, uh, including rotations, and importantly, cover crops. And while we have seen some successes in these campaigns, we've also seen a number of key barriers, especially among producers, that are inhibiting them from taking on such important practices. I feel that we need to keep these barriers in mind over the next few days during our discussions, because without changing producers' behaviors uh, and adopting these conservation practices, uh, then we're not going to make very much progress in our overall goals. Number one, we found that tradition tends to be a key barrier. Farmers don't want to change the way that they've been doing things all their lives. There tends to be a lack of awareness and knowledge in how to implement new practices. We found that some folks think it takes too much effort or there's too great of a cost to adapt to something new. There might be pressure from peers or landowners not to change what they're doing or a perception that doing something different is risky. And very importantly, uh, sometimes it's very uh, unclear how to communicate the reward of taking on new practices like planting cover crops. And that's part of why this conference is so important. It is our opportunity to start overcoming some of these challenges, to continue to raise awareness and to find ways to improve access to training and knowledge, and to work with everyone from producers to policymakers on adopting the best long-term approaches. Over the next day and a half, you'll hear from leaders across fields discussing the challenges and promises of better soil health practices. Some of our nation's best stewards are in this room, and we have an incredible opportunity to learn from them and to then encourage our peers to make more informed decisions. Ultimately, we, need, we know that we need to have a comprehensive strategy, and we have to build an inclusive and committed community working toward these goals if we hope to reach something like 20 million acres of cover crops by 2020. Through this conference, we have an excellent opportunity to do that, and we have an opportunity to continue making the most of each of our 40 chances. And so again, I want to thank everyone who has made the effort to come out today. I want to thank all the teams that have made this possible. Uh, and, uh, and I want to be uh, one of the first to welcome you to Omaha. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really an honor to have everyone here and a pleasure. So thank you again for coming out.